Welcome. On behalf of HBO, thank you all so much for taking the time to join us today to discuss the challenges and opportunities COVID has presented HBO and our partner institutions worldwide. My name is Lauren. I've been a staff member with HBO since 2019. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to introduce today Dr. Ankita Sagar. Ankita is a board certified internist and physician executive leader with expertise in quality improvement, clinical program building, healthcare delivery, and health policy. Ankita is the system vice president of clinical standards and variation reduction for physician enterprise at Common Spirit Health. She is an associated, uh, associate clinical professor of medicine at Creighton University. Ankita, uh, clinical interests include standardization of clinical quality, uh, ambulatory antimicrobial stewardship, post-COVID sequelae, and continuum of care for cancer, cancer survivors. She serves as the current co-chair of the Early Career Physician Committee for the New York chapter of the American College of Physicians, or ACP, as well as the council member for the Council of Early Career Physicians for the ACP. She was awarded the 2020 Laurean Award for the New York um, chapter of the ACP in recognition for her contributions in leading programs addressing physician well-being, physician advocacy for responsible public policy, as well as medical education. In 2021, she was the recipient of the Inspire Award by the American Medical Women's Association which honors women physicians who are inspirational and demonstrate vision, integrity, collaboration, and service. She has been an invited speaker at national conferences um, by professional organizations, including the American College of Physicians, the Society of General Internal Medicine. Uh, she has served as a panelist at regional and national conferences on topics including women in medicine, career development for early career physicians, burnout, and mentorship. Throughout this webinar, please ensure your microphones remain muted. The discussion will be recorded and uploaded to HVO's website and YouTube channel for future access. Please feel free to submit any questions via the chat feature, and we will address them in a Q&A session at the end of the discussion. With that, please welcome Dr. Sagar. Thank you, Lauren, and thank you, HBO, for bringing us together to talk about something very near and dear to a lot of our hearts and the experiences we've had. So we're here to talk about COVID, the challenges and opportunities in global education. It's a very important topic as we see our world has changed completely, and a lot of us think about our last three years as pre-COVID versus post-COVID or during COVID. We are here to talk to three amazing panelists with a diversity of perspectives and experiences. And I really want to take the opportunity to thank them for dedicating their time to HVO and also the education mission for medical trainees across the globe. I would love to introduce you to Dr. Jose Acuna Feoli. He works as an internist at the Internal Medicine Department in San Juan de Dios Hospital, San Jose, Costa Rica. He is a professor of medicine at the School of Medicine at University of Costa Rica. He participates as professor of the Internal Medicine Residency Program and has extensive experience in research and bioethics as previous independent member of the IRB in Ethics and Research at the University of Medical Sciences in Costa Rica, and participated in Vanderbilt University, NIH Fogarty Visiting Scholars for Ethics and Research Program. One of his main interests in clinical care is pine of care ultrasound. He was selected as the ACP International Fellowship Exchange Program for point of care ultrasounds at Oregon, Oregon Health and Science University. He spends a lot of clinical time on inpatient internal medicine wards, resident and student teaching, outpatient clinics, and consultant physician for surgical and obstetrics department at the hospital. Welcome, Dr. Acuna Feoli. Our next panelist is Robert Soa, who holds a BSc degree in physiotherapy from the University of Ghana. He began working at the Comfo Anoke Teaching Hospital in 2014. He is the on-site coordinator for HVO Physical Therapy Project at this hospital. 
Ghana's corresponding member to IFSHT since 2016 and is the board chair for Heal Home Care Advocacy Foundation. Welcome, Mr. Soa. And our next panelist is Dong Vibo, is the Director of Education Department at Angkor Hospital for Children in Siam Reap, Cambodia. He received in his nursing degree from Batambang Nursing School in 1997 and was the first group of nurses at H AHC when it opened its doors to see patients in 1999. He, has, he was swiftly promoted from staff to team leader in 2002, then to manager of outpatients in 2004, and to manager of nursing education in 2010, and the education director by 2018. He oversees medical education, nursing education, and volunteer activities at AHC. In addition to his full-time role at AHC, he is involved in teaching different universities across Cambodia both public and private schools. So welcome to all of our panelists. We will get started on our discussion. And first things first, let's think about and recognize the impact of the pandemic across delivery of cases worldwide. So I'm going to share with you a quick screen grab uh, from the latest data from WHO. So we are now at approximately 600, over 600 million confirmed cases worldwide of COVID. Within the last 24 hours, and this is as of September 13th, so about a week ago, uh, we are a little less than 500,000 new cases. Unfortunately, mortality has been a really significant aspect of the COVID response. Uh, we have over 6.5 million deaths across the world from COVID. But that's not to overshadow the immense impact that vaccines have had, where we, we have seen the administration of over 12 billion vaccine doses across the world. So definitely impacting all of our worlds, most in the personal way, in a professional way, um, but also in an educational manner. So I wanna really turn this conversation over to start discussing what have you all seen? Right, it's changed the life in most of our critical ways, but especially Rebol, I would love to hear from you, what has been the impact of the pandemic at your local program? And how did this change your daily routine of education and delivering care to patients? Thank you, Ankita. Yes, uh, I think for the first year, there were a lot of fear. Yeah, there were no cases in Cambodia, but people are scared to come to hospital. We spent until November in 2020, yes, the first year waiting and watching what's going on around the world, yeah. And also, Simria, where my hospital is, is a uh, tourist city. All tourists are go back home, yeah, they go back from our country and go to their country and it's train time. The airport closed completely in Simbria. Yeah. Some serious cases still come to our hospital, but general outpatient number were reduced. We were, uh, you know, our hospital is uh, rely on the funding from outside. So we worry about the funding because all the events that we raised the fund from outside were cancelled because of social distance or country try to close. Any country try to close, not cannot uh, conduct any event to raise the fund for her, for the hospital. So we were something that we assume to be, uh, come quickly to our country, uh, like the person who like come to our country, like they import to Cambodia. But I think in March 2020, we have a case in Siem Reap, but uh, no community transmission. So I think for that, until November uh, and February 2021, that we have many cases happen in Cambodia. So 
in the first year, we are very scared for that. But in 2021, we start to have tests and actually many cases. But our government start to provide vaccine in March and April in 2021. So it helped increase staff comfort. Yeah, with what might coming a lot in 2021. During the COVID, we have uh, like incorrect more IC protocol, but I think right now we go back to normal, but must still require on caretaker of patient and staff. Yeah, and we encourage our staff to get vaccine. Yeah, even not required, not mandatory required, but we still encourage them to get. And for our staff, we have around 99% that get vaccine. Yeah, only some of them that cannot get because of the medically contraindicated. For many staff now up to fifth though, yeah. And for our education, we still continue our routine activity, but we change from in-person to online. Yeah, our CNE or our CME, we change from in-classroom to online, and we still uh, welcome to our medical intern or nursing student throughout the pandemic, and they able to do their normal activity at the hospital, some group, have more difficult time in town in their town because of localized lockdown. Yeah. And also some intern, some medical intern or some nursing students were used by the government for COVID vaccine dry or testing site or quarantine service or quarantine center in Phnom Penh mm -hmm. or in any province at the border as well. Yeah, that's its impact to our care and also routine education. Thank you. Wow, thank you. And it sounds like while there were a lot of helpful things from the government that were coming forward, it also seemed like there's this initial difficulty in maintaining the staff between how to take care of being avoiding of COVID at the same time, getting vaccinated, but maybe moving around the staff and areas that have shortage. So thank you so much for sharing that. And I guess one of the things that I've been very curious and, and learning a lot more about has been the response of our workforce when it comes to trauma response and the psychiatry behind trauma response. And um, one of the things that I've learned recently has been about um, this idea that when you when you have a crisis occur, there's a emotional response with lows and highs. Highs meaning a lot of energy. Lows meaning really having a difficult time with grief and trauma and moral injury. And as we saw for New York and New Jersey, we all experienced these lows initially and then a, a boom phase and then a significant drop when everybody realized this is something that's going to stay for a long time. And I want to invite us to start thinking about, besides having the impact of the numbers and the staffing and cases, the trauma response. So I um, want to invite Jose to share a little bit about what has been the team morale in the last few years in and around the educational programs, as well as the team members in the hospitals in Costa Rica. Yes, Ankita, thank you so much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to, to share with um, everyone our experiences in, in the COVID pandemic. I will say that the team morale, actually, the graphic that you already show us, actually, um, it, it show all really well what happened during all these years. But sometimes happens quickly. Sometimes takes takes months. But actually, I would say, for at least in in my hospital, we had a lot of uh, problems, especially at the at the beginning. There was a, a lot of a. Uh, uh, we were afraid because we we're seeing what was happening in, 
in Europe, remember at the beginning of uh, uh, 2020, uh, there was a lot of deaths in Italy and Spain. So we were a little bit um, concerned. Then um, New York came uh, after them and uh, it was also a disaster, I think. So at the, at the beginning, it was like uh, afraid it was, uh, there was concern about uh, uh, the um, physicians' families and the, the, the teams and especially the older teachers that we have there in our, in our own hospital. So because some of them were um, our teachers actually and now we have to take care of them and uh, uh, especially the younger generations uh, we had to to take a, a step um, uh, to try to cover the spaces of the hospital that were assigned to COVID right and a lot of vets were reconverted right so at the beginning you feel like there was cohesion uh, like uh, some some um a cohesion of the of the group and the community were um, behind us like uh, you could hear the claps in the afternoon the um, uh, firefighters um, uh, uh, sirens and all that stuff that were more like um, external signs but also help at the beginning but as you know probably with the time all that that feelings usually come down and then the next year 2021 was a little bit of um i think the, the get the, the you could feel the the tired everyone was tired we hit we hadn't any space for uh, teaching um because all the the usual clinical sessions all the lectures um were stopped and actually our residency program and some of the universities also stopped their teaching their so the, the the residents were hired as uh, general physicians, not as residents in the hospitals, because every everything was to re to to re, be reinvented to to deal with the with the pandemic, and then after this um, tired tired phase, we had the, a little bit of a, like encouraged because we have like little boost of, of like uh, I will say like moral boosts because you had the, the vaccine at some point make the people feel a little bit more like confident and, and feel like there's like a, a window, uh, um, a goal that could be reached, right? And then um, again, tired and burnout. So it was like a mix between these ups and downs, I, I will say. And at the, at the end of that year, the last year, I, I will say that it was like despair because the people, especially the, the physicians, I uh, feel like the, the, the community and the, and the nation, at least in my country, the nation was not doing enough, right? They were like, just not caring enough. And we were tired. And we also uh, had like a, a, a tsunami of non covid pathologies that were there. So, and we were trying again to, to, in, to, to introduce lectures and introduce some of the teaching so it was it was a little bit um, exhausting. Now I think that we are getting more close to a new, uh, like a new, like a basal state, right? So trying to find um, the way that it will work better is not the same as before the pandemic, but we are trying to introduce things that we have learned from the pandemic. Uh, we are doing more e-learning. That's good. We are doing more like um, non-presence, uh, like virtual kind of meetings. That's good also. We are dealing, we are also communicating with within hospitals easier than before because the pandemic pushed us to do that. And so all these tools, especially the, the web tools are better used now, I think. But um, there are new, there are like old things that we are trying to adapt, right? Like the, for example, the the ground rounds. We're trying to do a, again ground rounds, but we are like limited because we don't have enough space, and uh, there are places of the hospital because we have isolated areas wards because COVID. We are not allowed to do rounds there, so we are trying to manage that, and and I think some of the physicians end up this um, uh, pandemic really exhausted and burned out, and they are just. Uh, some of them, especially the, the ones that are near of the retirement, they just want to get retired soon. 
and the new ones are a little bit scared and sometimes uh, disappointed because different things happen during the pandemic and because we have deals in our social security systems and and, and so it's a, it's a mix between i think of emotions that the people had to deal with and at least the heads of the of the of the of the departments want to um, regain uh, attention to non-covid pathologies because we have like a a huge, a huge amount of chronic illness that were not well uh, managed during the, uh, the COVID the pandemic because all the efforts were uh, focused on the pandemic. So I think that will also put us a little bit more stress and could burn out some of the physicians that uh, have not been in that in that space or that area and uh, still not there. Right. So we will have to to wait this year mm -hmm. and next year to see what happened. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, you hit on so many different themes right there. One is what happened to the training? How do you adapt to the educational mission of a lot of these programs? And then third, which to me rings true very much, is how the leadership of these healthcare teams has changed because younger folks are having to step up to be able to lead teams that previously they may not have been leading. Um, and this early retirement and the shortage of workforce. So very similar themes to what we've all just mentioned about maintaining staffing. Uh, so agreed. And I'm wondering, Robert, from your perspective in Ghana, how, how did you guys adapt to this mission of continuing education, especially in the pandemic? So thank you so much. Sorry. Thank you so much, Ankita, for and Israel for the privilege to be able to talk about this topic. So pre-pandemic, we rely heavily on education from volunteers from the US and Canada and another part of the world. And so when the pandemic hit, we were thrown in a limbo. We didn't know what was going to happen to education because all that we knew was in-person education where the volunteers come, we learn from them on the job. And after that, we organize our staff. They give a couple of presentations. So now we didn't know what to do. And knowing very well that we are in an environment where it's difficult to get internet access and so on and so forth. Going, going to do something virtual was something we were thinking about how feasible and possible it's going to be then um, thankfully HBO came to us with this amazing program with the American Society for Hand Therapy and the REA program where now we're able to organize a very effective education virtually. The same experience therapists who were supporting us during the pre-pandemic where the same therapist some were able to get in touch with and were able to have sometimes monthly, sometimes twice every month of online education. And the, the most amazing thing about this is, you see, initially we, during the pandemic, the education was more to probably my hospital. But when it became virtual, it, it gave opportunities to others in all over the country. So what it means is if you share the link, wherever the person is in the country, they are able to connect and still learn. It doesn't have to be from our hospital. And to the extent that we even had students who also became very interested because at that time, all the students were sent home, virtual education was not possible because of how remote some of them were. So as a way of also keeping them sharp during the pandemic. When you share this link to them, they have time on their hands. Some who could afford and have the internet in their homes were able to connect and they were able to learn so much. It, it was amazing sometimes the feedback that came from those who were not in this hospital, who for the first time, they get to hear of certain techniques that are being used to treat certain cases. And then you call them or they call you back and give you one of the most amazing feedback you could ever think that, oh, you did this and it worked. 
and they couldn't believe such things were 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 readily available, and it, it was amazing. Initially, to the struggle was also thinking about how many people we could get to connect because we thought probably when since we are going virtual, people might think it's expensive to connect and all that. But it was amazing. Sometimes we go average twenty, connecting sometimes thirty, and the information were very very educative. Everybody that joined felt they they got something out of whatever was, was shared during the, the period. And so we were very grateful for that opportunity. One other thing too was before the RE was introduced, we were just sharing Zoom links. And so the difficulty was sending the correct emails, sending the links to the correct right. emails. Yeah. So if you make a mistake and you don't get the emails right, it means that the person will not have the opportunity to connect to the, uh, the, uh, the platform. But when the REA program came, you don't need to worry about getting the right email. All you need to do is to send them the link. They come to the website. They're able to connect directly. And the amazing, too is, amazing thing too is they have the slides. So now you don't have to worry about sharing the slides to anybody. That body is taken away from you. So they can directly go and watch over and over again. And those who even miss will go back. And so. That program too was amazing. It took a lot of pressure off my neck. And I'm sure my other colleagues could attest to that fact that it wasn't easy trying to send individually slides and um, recorded um, presentations to those who were connecting uh, virtually. So we thank you guys for such an amazing program. And we are very grateful for that. Thanks, Robert, for sharing that. And I agree when, when REI was introduced to me, I was also blown away by, by its abilities. So I do want to allow Lauren uh, to represent the HBO staff and share a little bit about this amazing program called REI. Take it away, Lauren. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, as you can see here, in our first year of e-learning, uh, HVO was able to facilitate over 335 assignments uh, with our HVO volunteers. Uh, that resulted in over 6,290 hours of training um, it, across 48 of our projects. So these weren't just um, down to didactic lectures. We also had case conferences, journal clubs, uh, mentorships, grand rounds, and curriculum design. That's just fantastic. And for those of us who have not experienced REI, and I'm going to have we bowl just in a minute explain how REI is being used locally in their program. But basically, REI has allowed HVO to leverage the volunteers that we have to be able to provide and continue that education remotely. And it has the ability to everything that Robert just said, that people across multiple locations can log in. Um, and then also it allows us to maintain that continuity and the connection between our volunteers and the spaces and the places that they've been wanting to volunteer in. So it's been phenomenal for me as a, as a project coordinator director um, for Costa Rica to see this really come to fruition. And um, we will, would you like to share us, how have you guys used REI locally for your education initiatives? Yeah, thank you again. Yeah, I think for, First, we have only like in-person volunteers who come to our hospital to provide training. But when we have COVID, I, uh, we start to think about how we can continue our like training to our doctor in the hospital. And then we learn something from online classes that we change our CNE and CME session and then be thinking about how about volunteer come uh, like provide training through online and then we have start uh, we used to have like uh, oncology program that we do 
trending every week. And then be thinking about that can be benchmark from that and continue to other project that we want to uh, have volunteer to provide to us. I think for online volunteer, we have like more beneficial that we think. Yeah, it takes a while to establish relationship between our team and volunteer team. Yeah, but when they start to know each other, they continue to exchange information and improve their collaboration between volunteer online and yeah, our team in AAC. Uh, you know, online also like e economical way to supplement the learning. Yeah, they have case discussion, they have uh, uh, sharing information each other. Yeah, and they discuss about the complex cases in the uh, hospital or the give idea from volunteer to change the management in the hospital. That the way we uh, think that the online have helped and then the platform that HBO create and then it useful for us, easy for us to join and easy for us to uh, participate in the discussion. Yes. That's great, people. And, and to piggyback on what you're mentioning about these case conferences. So from what I heard was that you guys are able to really discuss a spectrum of cases, whether it's pediatric neurology, neonatal, pediatric endocrine, all the way to pediatric ICU cases, and really get some of that expert advice in management of these cases, which is amazing. But also, I've also heard that when it comes to our larger healthcare team and thinking beyond only physicians and nurse practitioners and PAs, are, I heard that lactation and nutrition teams were able to use REI as well in your area. Yes. Yeah, correct, yeah. I think our team, uh, our lactation and uh, nutrition team use now weekly. Yeah, we, uh, we recruit the team, uh, volunteer team in United States and then our team in AAC, they meet uh, on Thursday every week, yeah. That's and, fantastic. Um, yeah, yeah. Great. Um, and then Robert, I wanted to know if you wanted to share a little bit more about the multinational collaborative program with REI between Ghana and Rwanda and HBO. Yeah, uh, I mean, I was so happy when I was approached by this project. And I'm really looking forward to it because looking at the fact that we are having, we're going to have a lecture series um, graduate students from the U.S. and then we have our colleagues in Rwanda who also be connecting. We are looking forward to how we will learn from this experience um, therapists who are coming to teach us about how to manage force and it's going to be really exciting and I'm really looking forward to it. I was very happy when Lauren approached me about it. Uh, that's fantastic. I can imagine how many opportunities will open up when we think about multinational collaborations and in the best way possible. But we also recognize, you know, our, our world has shifted because of COVID. And now we're in this new phase where things are starting to open up, where we know our volunteers are eager to return to the sites for overseas placement. And um, in my discussions with HVO, I've always heard this commitment from HVO to build local capacity. And part of that is how do we make sure that these in-person assignments when they do start are appropriate, are well set up, and volunteers and our on-site teams know what to expect. Jose, I was wondering, in our conversations, we've talked a lot about how the physical site has changed where education is provided, but also certain requirements of the programs have changed also. And I wanted to know if you wanted to add from your lens, what's changed physically in, in the hospitals for you guys? 
Yeah, um, thank you for for asking that. I think probably for the for the for the next uh, steps, uh, at, at least uh, for HBO program, we will need to to change the way that we're we're doing things before. Before we had like a classroom that it was uh, always free, and we used for for the the volunteers to give lectures, and then we could then uh, we could uh, let them. Uh, be at the wards, interact with the residents, with the staff. Now um, the things have been changed because we have like uh, uh, all those areas have been used for different uh, um, um, things or um, uh, medical uh, uh, um, supplies that we need for COVID patients because the the, the classrooms are usually near of that areas where we use in uh, wards for COVID patients. So now we don't have that area. So finding the spaces are you, are more difficult now. We have to, to walk outside the hospital and getting the residents out that, outside the hospital is not a usual, uh, usually easy. We have to, to interact with a lot of people to, to make that happen, right? So probably my, my guess is that in the, in the future, we will need to do like a hybrid kind of programs because I will also assume my, my comment as all the other panelists that the REA is actually a really good tool. I love it. Actually, it's a really easy to use. You could find the past lectures there, the people that it was not able to 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 uh, enter into the into the Zoom meeting because they already have like a different um, uh, things that were scheduled for them. That's also a, a, an important part of the of the next step, uh, steps for HBO. Is now the 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 locally uh, way that the things were were done before has already changed. For example, my schedule has changed. The schedule of my my colleague also has changed. So everyone has new schedules because we have to adapt the different spaces of the hospital. So we, we now don't have the spaces to converge, right, as before. So it's a little bit more difficult. And so I think doing hybrid programs could be something interesting in the, in the future. So having this era, i.e., um, as part of the of the of the HBO program, will help to have fellow lectures and then the volunteer be at uh, um, uh, reinforcing um, thoughts or teachings or trying to be more like uh, in the in the in the practice area, right? And the other thing is, I will say that probably we will need to ask not only in Costa Rica but in other countries. How is the, the different things that we need for uh, for the volunteers to accomplish to enter to different hospitals? Because at least in Costa Rica, we have each hospital has their own um, uh, things that they ask for. And if you are in the social security system, usually they will ask the same thing in each in the in the, in the national hospitals, but they will ask for complete vaccination uh, uh, scheme, all that, all, uh, all the information uh, where the people are going to be. So we have to be more detailed than before. It was more relaxed before. And I don't, I don't know if at some point that will change and I guess it will change because everything is relaxing in, in at least in COVID, uh, for the COVID um, area. Uh, and I will say that also in the future, we will try to be to have this interaction of the volunteers to be more um, based on the side as 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 before, but with the specific um, goals, right? Not as before as to interact with more like lectures and then uh, be at the at the words, but trying to have goals for the for the volunteer to be at the side, right? So when the volunteer comes, they already know what the goal of their visit is. So like more specific and like could be shorter kind of visits, right? As before, because we could have this, this mixed kind of a program and uh, like a hybrid, but 
I, we will have to adapt. And, and, and the thing, and the most important thing is that the people want to have this interaction. And I think it's, it's good. And there's something good about all the, 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 the tools that we have for, for the web that they're great. I love it. But we, we miss things uh, that, that are not the same if you are in person. So this uh, in-person teaching uh, will make the interaction between the teacher and the students better, right? And you could, you could actually, you could feel it when you are doing classes or lectures through through Zoom. It's not the same. Yeah. So trying to 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 have this interaction in in life and in person, it will be important also. So um, I will I will of course be open with it what HBO uh, decide, and we will try to do our best to adapt uh, this uh, new uh, beginning of uh, HBO um, visits. Thanks, Jose. And I think that dovetails really beautifully into opening up our audience Q&A session. And I invite our audience to submit questions for our panelists to answer and I'm going to invite April and Lauren back on and Lauren one of the things that's come up a few times is what is this wonderful REI program can you tell us more about it yeah happy to um, so the REI stands for remote education interface it's a website that HBO has developed in order to centralize and facilitate all aspects of e-learning. So we started small with just links to Zoom meetings. Um, so instead of sending out Zoom, as, as Soa said, now participants and volunteers will come to one specific URL, which was designed for their program. This webpage offers a join now feature where you can click and it immediately lets you into your uh, Zoom meeting, which is hosted by HVO. We then have the ability to record that meeting. We have someone on our staff who does an amazing job of cutting out any of the before and after interactions, consolidating just that lecture portion of the topic. Um, and then we put a nice slide on it and get it back up onto the REI along with the PowerPoint slides so that our participants can then come and either review the video and rewatch the entire lecture or just view the slides that they're interested in. That then expanded to including schedules so that our volunteers and our participants had a good sense of um, what time their lectures or what lectures were gonna be taught at specific times according to uh, their time zone, which is always a big conversation when planning uh, lectures across countries. Um, we also have the ability to include features such as discussion boards, links to pre-organized um, WhatsApp groups or Telegram groups. Um, we've included now resources that are just sent from our volunteers who have had the opportunity to volunteer and then afterwards find maybe a free course or an article or a resource where they think, well, I think this would be great supplementary materials. Um, so we can now share those resources much easier. Um, and as we continue going with e-learning, we are constantly have discussions with our sites and our volunteers to see what they might need in order to uh, build on the platform that we already have. So that means that our volunteers can come to us and say, I think it would be great to have a breakout room uh, and we have the opportunity to then go facilitate that. Um, or if it's, it's a suggestion that we're not quite sure, we have someone on the team who can go and look into the potential of adding any additional applications to a site. Um, so I think just from an HVO standpoint, we've been really excited about uh, all of the reception to the REI. And while I think it was a very initial response to the pandemic, Moving forward with HVO, e-learning isn't going anywhere. We are looking forward to reopening our projects um, in a hybrid model where our volunteers will have the opportunities to work with our sites both overseas in the capacity that they were prior to the pandemic, but then also they'll have the opportunity to do those orientation sessions and any didactic lectures prior to ever stepping foot on site. 
Um, so we're really looking forward to the community that this builds and, and the, the growth and the amount of uh, education we can deliver using the REIs. That's fantastic, Lauren, uh, because I think all of our minds are just probably going to flutter with so many ideas of how we could use REI from case conferences to well-being modules to didactics and breakouts and all good, that good stuff. So it is fantastic that h is able to offer this to both the volunteers who may be new to the area and are unsure what to expect, but they can start in this hybrid model that they get to know the teams and then perhaps go in person. So that's amazing. Thank you for really setting this up um, as the REI platform. So thank you, thank you. I think we have a couple of questions from audience members. And um, one of the questions that I've also sort of faced a little bit is, you know, these are great ways to have these didactics and lectures get delivered. How how can our volunteers receive some feedback on this topic was useful or can you do more of X, Y, and Z or can we have you join us for case conferences? So is there a way that um, our volunteers receive this feedback currently or is planned in the near future? And I guess I'm going to open this up to Lauren first and then to our panelists on how they feel locally we could get that feedback. Yeah, so um, I think that in order to get feedback and comments from our learners, we have been working directly with the on-site coordinators. Um, but one of the main features of the REI, which we've actually uh, started to use, is we have the opportunity to include any kind of questionnaire or surveys. So a lot of our volunteers have been asking to start pre and post tests um, and then also evaluations. So at the beginning of their courses, they'll have the opportunity to answer any questions about the lecture. Um, so the lecturer gets the sense of the um, education level that they're coming in and starting at. After the lecture, we'll then have those same participants answer a similar questionnaire, um, frequently with feedback questions asking about how they can improve or what additional topics. And this has really given us the ability to go through, get a good sense of who uh, is looking for what information and also just any feedback. Um, it's also been really helpful for me just to have the opportunity to work with all of our panelists um, and all of our other project directors and on-site coordinators around the globe who are, keep in touch with each other and, and keep me updated on how the lectures are going, how we can improve, and where our next steps are going to be. That's fantastic, Lauren. I think um, one of the other questions that was mentioned, I'm going to adapt it a little bit uh, from what was stated each of our sites and and in hbo all the regions that hbo serves um, are, are sort of facing a lot of changes when it comes to political concerns war but also thinking about climate change and i know that we're represented by ghana costa rica and cambodia all the sites that have are are really experiencing this perhaps to a much more exponential way than others. Wondering from our panelists, is, is climate change a topic of discussion in these education initiatives? Or is how are you all adapting to it and with COVID in the background? I could have started if you want to. Yeah, go for it. Okay. Um, yeah, sure. Um, first, for, for the last question, I, I will agree with Lauren that actually we try as um, on-site coordinators of, of interact with uh, our uh, volunteers and then give them uh, feedback. Usually a couple of weeks, uh, weeks after the visit, could be a mail or could be a, a short meeting through, through Zoom or actually WhatsApp and video call. Some, some of, 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 of that have be, has been done uh, for different volunteers. And I think it's it's important because in that way they will also could ad adapt their their teaching and their lectures for future 
interaction as volunteers or if they are uh, interested in coming into the, like in, in, in person to the to the site because uh, this this past year has been uh, done through through virtually everything so um, i think it's important that feedback and also that feedback from them to us it's really important sometimes they don't feel like uh, the people is uh, enough interest uh, in their topics or uh, they feel like uh, there was like not a, a good connection between um between the audience and, uh, and them so for me it's also important to try to adapt things here because sometimes the people is uh, overwhelmed with their uh, work and different things that they are doing in the daily daily basis uh, uh, schedules okay um and about uh, your question and keep that it's really interesting because we actually have uh, people from infectious disease from um different areas uh, public health uh, also that also uh, has has been a, this um, um like environmental or global uh, environmental environmental changes has been uh, addressed in different uh, uh, lectures and here is um uh, we we think costa rica is a leader country of uh, of environment because we have a our our energy is um, like 90 98 99 percent free of a like a renewable so for us it's quite important to to address this and it's not only about the warming the global warming and different things that is has been uh, but in medicine we have uh, seen a lot of changes in in, in health especially with uh, the coming of uh, for example um more diseases from outside because we are more connected so uh, it's not about only the environment the environmental changes it's like the global change i think and um, this um, interconnection between countries and between uh persons is, is, is more like and and the best example is pandemic i mean the pandemic uh, uh, traveled the world uh, i think probably at least five times and you could see like actually here in costa rica we were prepared for the next wave because we were now we were seeing that there were that were uh, things that happened in the us or in europe and actually a couple of uh, months after uh, they uh, or you lived that we we were facing the same problems so i think it's it's more like a global kind of approach and it's it's really it's something that we we address often and we talk uh, with the rest of the residents that we're more interconnected and, and it's not only environmental things but all the all the this hyper connected are like a like a global kind of uh, interaction absolutely robert go for it i think that was a very important question you asked because i mean if you look at the hospital itself in my hospital there's a lot of a lot of waste that is being generated here and mm. we know some of this waste that is being generated how it's being like it's being um disposed as a huge effect on the environment as well and i think moving forward if hvo could kind of include climate change or topics about the environment on how hospital could play a significant role in the reduction of waste which goes back to our communities to let us have these environmental changes that we're seeing currently because now as we speak we can predict the various seasons in my country it's supposed to be dry as we speak the whole of today has been raining so wow. it's a very important question you ask and um yeah, i think moving forward it really should look for ways and means of addressing environmental changes as we, as it is now that's it's such an important point. I agree with you that it's uh, it's not just about warming climate and what are we adding to this global change of the environment in general. Uh, Weevil, anything you would like to add from your lens? Yes, I think for the first question related to the feedback to volunteers, I think for our project at the hospital, we have uh, like, Every three months, I need to check all the project that any problem or any issue or any kind of 
uh, that we need to solve or uh, and then we give feedback directly to HBO side or HBO and then we can find a way that moving forward for that. That's for the question number one. And for the second one related to global or environmental project. In our hospital, we start, I, I think about a few years ago, about plastic reduction in the hospital. That's, that we have done, and we try to change behavior of staff. And also right now we move that project to community as well. Our team, uh, teach people in the village about uh, how to reduce the plastic use in the daily life. Yes, that's from me. Yeah. And I think it's, it's so appropriate because when it comes to hospital clinics, our own homes, there, there's so many ways that we're using one-time use products that we should really be thinking about not using or recycling in some way. Uh, I know that we're almost at time. I want to give a few last minute words to our panelists and Lauren uh, to share. So uh, I will start with Jose, Robert, Weevil, and then Lauren, you can take us home. So thank you so much for the invitation again. Uh, it was a pleasure to, to share. And, and I really appreciate the, the interaction with, between HBO and our project in Costa Rica. And want to be thankful with, with everyone behind the, the, the program. And there's a lot of, of people that it, it's connect, they are connected to this meeting and they, they know that they were important to, to develop this program. And some of them, they are not at this point, but also help a lot to develop the Costa Rican program. So uh, I think we have, we're facing two uh, different um, uh, probably uh, uh, changes uh, and challenges for the future in the program. And we will have to adapt as usual. That's uh, I think a, a positive kind of, uh, of attitude to, to be able to adapt to the, to the changes. So thank you. Well said, Robert. Okay, so we want to show a uh, profound gratitude to HBO for the fun opportunity they came. How far they were able to even think of us of going virtual to designing the REA, I mean, was a game changer for us. And we're looking forward to volunteers as well. We all miss the in-person interaction. However, REA has come to stay and we will never say no to those who want to connect with us virtually. And so be thankful to you guys for making it possible for, for, so, for us to still be educated even in the middle of a pandemic. Thanks, Robert. Weevil? Yes, yeah, thanks for inviting me to join this webinar and yeah, talk about HBO PVT that we do at our site. And I'm interested about uh, multinational training or something like that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I used to, uh, I have one project we call analysis team. And then instead of volunteer provide lecture, I think we start to give the opportunity to the local people to provide a lecture instead of volunteer. I think from that point, maybe we can expand to like the project that have connection like multinational uh, project that we can do take turn for local staff to provide lecture instead of volunteer that will improve also the local people. That's from my point, yes, thank you. Right, absolutely, always about building local capacity. That's our mission and vision, so agreed 100%. Lauren, take us home. Well, first off, thank you everyone for joining. It's been such a great conversation. Ankita, You've been an amazing moderator. We are so grateful to have you both as a project director for Internal Medicine Costa Rica. Uh, and today, just to help us with this discussion, um, at the end of the day, we are unable to do what we do here at HVO without our on-site coordinators. So Vibel, Jose, and Soa, thank you so much for everything that you all do. Um, 
we are so grateful to have the opportunity to provide lectures to you and we look forward to to continuing the education into 2023 and the years beyond so thank you so much everyone for joining us and we hope to see you on the next webinar thank you.